All right, folks, we've been telling you about the story out of Mason, Tennessee, whether it's Texas, whether it's Tennessee controller wanted to take over the finances of the city because of misappropriation of funds. Well, they got sued by the Tennessee NAACP, and now a settlement was reached today. Let's talk about that uh, with one of the leaders uh, there in Tennessee. Uh, NAACP also just a moment ago sent out a press release announcing this. Uh, the uh, president of the NAACP in the state, Van Turner, joins us right now, representing Mason in their lawsuit. Van, how you doing? Doing very well. Thank All you right, so, so tell us about this settlement that between uh, the state and Mason, Tennessee. Well, the, uh, the lawsuit accomplished what it was uh, set out to accomplish. The uh, town of Mason still preserves its charter. As you know, the comptroller asked that the town relinquish its charter, and that's what started everything. So they preserved, they preserved the charter. Uh, point two the monthly obligations that they have to pay back to their to their water sewer fund was cut in half. We're talking about going from a ten thousand dollar payment down to a five thousand dollar payment. Uh, the uh, month the weekly obligation in which they had to report has now been pushed out to a monthly obligation, which is a lot more feasible and reasonable for the part time CFO uh, for the town of Mason. The $100 expenditure cap has now been pushed out to $1,000 because there was very little that any town or city could do that was under $100. And mind you, they had to ask to spend uh, over $100, and that was them asking. Uh, which we felt was punitive, has now been reduced down to a four. Uh, a two-year plan has now been reduced down to a four-month plan. So all of this will end as far as the uh, corrective, ag corrective action measures. All of this will end on August 31, 2022. So we uh, counted as a victory for the town of Mason, and we were happy that uh, we were able to represent them in this matter. Uh, how have officials, how have city officials responded uh, to this news? Uh, they are elated. Uh, what we are doing on Monday is having a town hall meeting at the town of Mason uh, that will take place at approximately 630. Uh, we will be in attendance to support the town. Mayor Gooden and Vice Mayor Rivers are very uh, happy with the settlement. I think the town is happy. And this allows the town to be in place for all the opportunities that the Ford Motor Company uh, project will yield. And that, of course, was uh, the most important thing because uh, it was the economic impact this plan is going to bring and how Mason is going to benefit. That's absolutely correct. So this is a $6 billion project for the Ford uh, electric vehicles uh, that's really uh, coming to really four or five miles away from Mason. Mason is a key player as far as the economic development of this West Tennessee area. And so what is of importance is that they're going to have to run a, a pipeline from the Ford Motor Company uh, to the Mississippi River to uh, treat their water. Uh, as I stated before, for any project of this magnitude to take place, you have to bring in the good water and you have to take out the bad water. And the town of Mason had a very valuable uh, sewer uh, treatment permit. And so they are big players because of this permit that they hold as far as uh, what's going to happen with the development of the Ford Motor Project, as well as the development that will take place around uh, the town of Mason and in, the, and in these other areas. Uh, contractors are moving in. Real estate developers are moving in. They're looking at developing the land, and they're going to need the uh, water treatment uh, to be uh, successful in their developments. And that's why Mason is so critical to what's about to take place there. All right, then. Well, look, this is certainly uh, good news, and we certainly appreciate uh, the work the Tennessee NAACP has been doing uh, to ensure uh, Mason uh, gets uh, justice. And is it uh, screwed by the state of Tennessee? Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, reporting on this story. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. I was going to bring on my panel, Dr. Larry Walker, Assistant Professor, University of Central Florida, Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University, and Crystal Knight is a Democratic strategist. Uh, Greg, I'll start with you. Uh, look, uh, you know, we've been covering this uh, from day one. This is why all the people, I love hearing people who say, oh, you know what, I don't see what the NAACP is doing. Well, this is an example of why supporting civil rights organizations 
organizations matters because Mason could not afford to fight the, tech, the, the Comptroller. They didn't have the resources. And so by having the Tennessee branch of the NAACP step in, that's what allowed them to be able to take the state to court to reach this settlement. That's absolutely right, Roland. And again, everybody, please, you hear Roland said this over and over again. You say you can't be black media and be scared. You've got to support independent media. You've been covering this all along. Um, this week, everybody's shocked, shocked to see the Supreme Court uh, draft opinion in the abortion case. Well, guess what? That's what courts do. And the brother you just had on, who leads the NAACP there, was in court. They were in court in Davidson County, my hometown, Nashville, in Chancery Court. And I and I believe they scared the hell out of the Comptroller's office because they filed an equal protection claim. There are two white little schools, uh, the, the, the towns, Jellicoe and Van Buren, who are 93 and 96 percent white, whose finances weren't in as bad shape as you've been covering now for a couple of months now, who were not taken over, who were given different deals. But, you know, uh, the thing that I'm interested in now, and I think we all are interested in, will be to see how the town of Mason will benefit without being disadvantaged. I hope they're at the table. Because one of the things, finally, that we see when you see these kind of takeovers often is that uh, these little towns are put at risk. So if they've got to pump that water out, we got environmental racism concerns. Uh, we've seen this happen with highway construction through these little towns when they're taken over by the counties. And i got to believe that part of the reason they were trying to get their hands on Mason was so that they could run some of this stuff through there. And it would disadvantage the town, but it would benefit the county. So I guess we'll see what happens next. Um, and, and, and Crystal, uh, I, I talk a lot on this show about having strong black institutions. And when we have strong black institutions, then we're able to fund lawsuits, to be able to pay lawyers. We talk about it with black with black owned media as well. And having that expertise is crucial to be able to assist, whether it's a Mason, Tennessee, whether it's a majority black school board, uh, whether it's uh, individual complainants. And so I- I'm always trying to get people to understand why when we as African-Americans support our institutions with our dollars, when we are demanding our fair share of resources, uh, when it comes to corporations, when it comes to government, uh, the result is that we are then able to fight back uh, when we have situations like this. Absolutely. And I think just for some greater context as well, it's important to you know share that Van is not only a lawyer and he's the president of the Memphis chapter of the NAACP, but he's also an elected official. And so he understands politics at its core. And so that's just another nuanced thing that he's able to bring to the table when he's going to fight on behalf of this city. Um, but the other thing that you mentioned is that you know the, the institutional knowledge and having strong black, black institutions it is important. And a lot of times we, you know, complain about institutions. We complain about people being in charge or that these organizations aren't doing anything until we absolutely need them. And so this town is 45 minutes outside of Memphis, which is where I'm from. And I'm thankful for the leadership of Van, who also was very instrumental in the Take Them Down 901 movement, which removed Confederate statues out of downtown in the city of Memphis, which was also co-led by Tammy Sawyer, another um, county commissioner and activist in the city of Memphis. And so when we have our collective political power, legal power, and, um, you know, grassroots power combined, that absolutely helps in instances like this. And I like what Dr. Carr stated, that, you know, when Van and, and the NAACP showed up to represent this small town that was really being bullied by the Comptroller's office, that set the tone for where the conversation could go and what you know the community needs. And one other thing that I wanted to add that he stated about just the environmental things um, that the that the city needs is hopefully there's a a group in the in the city that's able to negotiate a community benefits agreement. What is something that Mason can receive on behalf of this Ford project that will absolutely benefit the residents of the community, that will absolutely be a long-term project where this major corporation isn't just coming in and, you know, using resources that are, you know, located in the city, but what are things that they can partner with? Is there a local school? Is there a project? Is there a community center or a park or anything that's 
tangible that people can say, because this project has come to this city, our community has benefited from it, and we have a better X or Y because of that. And so that's another thing that um, without that kind of leadership, people don't know what to ask for. And so I'm really just thankful that this is at least heading in the right direction, and hopefully the outcome will be great. Uh, Larry. So congratulations to the folks at Mason. We covered this a few weeks ago and talked about this in great detail, Roland. So first, I want to give you a shout out because you talked about the importance, and Dr. Carr talked about this, the importance of black media, because I don't remember really seeing this story anywhere else. And if you hadn't covered this story, the result that we've we've, we've seen now may not have occurred. So this is, once again, the importance of, of your platform and speaking the truth when it comes to issues that impact the black community. One of the things I was pleased to see in this agreement is that there was an end date, because that's one of the things that I worried about, you know, that this would go on for years and years and they would be watching the town like with a microscope. But the fact that it has an end date, I think this is really great. Once again, uh, congratulations to NAACP and all their work and efforts and all the grassroots folks. But once again, it shows the power of the black community galvanizing around an issue. And listen, we have to we have to take what happened at Mason and, and this, you know, I guess you can say, certainly a win. And we have to continue to use this when it comes to other issues throughout the country in which states or even the federal government are trying to force black folks, particularly black communities, to do things they shouldn't have to do, when it, particularly when it comes to relinquished power. But once again, I was pleased to see this, this outcome. But I want to also, also say, Roman, that we need to keep a close eye on this situation because we can, you know, this kind of could be a bait and switch, right? So we see this agreement, we turn our heads, and the next thing we know, uh, the state, again, once again, is coming after the folks at Mason. So I would say that we need to continue to watch this issue over the next several weeks, several months, and several years. So um, I often talk about um, Dr. King's book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? And, and one of the things that he said in that particular book, there were four institutions that were positioned to liberate black people. The black, he said the Negro church, the Negro press, Negro fraternities and sororities, and Negro professional organizations. That's what he said. And he said, all of our institutions have never fully committed themselves to black liberation. But what he said about black on, but about the Negro press, uh, Greg, he said specifically, he said, do not fall back towards the conservative, maintain a position of militancy. And there were a lot of people who were tweeting about Mason, Tennessee. There are people who were tweeting me saying, you, sh you should be talking about this here. And I'm like, you don't even watch the damn show. We are talking about it. We've had the vice mayor on the show multiple times. We had the NAACP state conference, the Memphis chapter on as well. And when people yesterday, when I was talking about uh, the SWAC conference, people were like, man, why are you dogging the SWAC? I said, no, I'm not dogging the SWAC. What I want is I want strong black institutions. I want strong HBCUs. I want strong conferences. The SWAC, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the presidents, the MEAC uh, announced today where they reaffirmed their commitment, the eight schools, uh, to maintain the MEAC conference. But what's, what's interesting to me is, Greg, we have way too many people who love to spend their time saying somebody needs to do something and we are the somebodies. We are the ones who can actually do that. I, look, I get it. I totally understand systemic racism. I totally get all of those things. But we also got to be honest that a lot of times we are getting in our own selves way. We're getting in the way in terms of not supporting our institutions. Uh, and so I'm not wasting time talking about what this person ain't doing or or this person. All these folks who call themselves new black media, but ain't covering nothing, ain't sitting in advance in the ball. What we have to have is we've got to have strong black institutions because I am tired of black people talking about us surviving when we should be having thriving conversations. That's exactly right, Roland. And one thing no one can accuse you of doing is sitting still. We know we're in commencement season. Uh, you've, uh, I, I think, well, I know I've lost count of how many HBCU commencements you've spoken. Um, <laughs> but you stress this over and over again. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of bright eyed young graduates walking across the stages across the country at our HBCUs. And I'm concerned as somebody who's on a faculty at HBCU that our institutions aren't doing enough to prepare these young people to understand that it isn't just about individual success. 
It is about that type of institutional strength that you're talking about. And, and when we talk about media, particularly, we're looking at the New York Times, the L.A. Times. We're looking at uh, the Washington Post. We're looking at investigative journal journalism taking hits, hit after hit after hit, newsrooms shrinking, budgets shrinking, crack reporters being driven off of uh, payrolls and finding themselves trying to start blogs or start websites. Meanwhile, what you've been doing not as a one-man gang, but virtually a one-man gang for a very long time, but as you got that support from the community and now have begun to gain momentum in getting those advertising dollars and pushing forward, you're bringing on staff, and you talk about this over and over again, to do investigative journalism. I think uh, what we just heard with this case with, with Mason is 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 essential. And, and Crystal, you're absolutely right. While these long-established institutions, like the NAACP and like the institutions that Dr. King talks about and where do we go from here, are always going to be important, it really is going to take grassroots uh, action. Because we know if they conceded this, as you say, Doc, as you say, Dr. Walker, if they conceded this, they've already put into motion the plan to do what they were going to do anyway. It would have been easier to run a pipeline through the middle of Mason if they, if the county was in control. But you better believe that Ford has already been in collusion with the state of Tennessee and everybody else to try to figure out how to get their agenda done. Now, who will stop that? Who will expose it? Who will give, in the words of Ida Wells, the light of truth? If not the black media, there will be no one. And so, you know, Roland, when you talk about the importance of black media and the importance of supporting our strong institutions, <coughs> it isn't about that great internship. It isn't just about getting that shiny award at, at being the reporter who gets to come in as an apprentice at one of these white institutions or linking up. No, it is about a black institution that isn't just black, but as you say, is not scared and has the requisite skills to stay after this uh, this story for, as you say, Larry, weeks, months, years necessary, and that takes resources, and it takes somebody who knows what they're doing to train people to do investigative journalism, because this story is far from over. Uh, it, it is uh, far from over, and, and Crystal, uh, this is not just about us covering the story, but again, it's also why, when I listen to people and I hear it all the time, this group ain't doing this, not doing that. I remember when I was in Chicago, and people were often complaining about the South Side branch of the NAACP. And they sucked. They did. And I said it on the air. I said to the leadership. But what I also told people was, go in and take it over. Mm -hmm. Literally, find out when the election is. Find out how many, guess what? If, if, if the last election, if 75 folks vote, go recruit 100 people to give $30 to membership. And guess what? Don't even, don't even tell anybody and walk in there and run your own slate and take it over. That's what, uh, 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 that's what Nakima Levy uh, uh, Pounds Armstrong did uh, in Minneapolis when they took over that particular branch. What I'm saying is we have black institutions, black institutions that are in need of black expertise. Right. And we've got to be also be honest. Because see, I love people who say, well, man, you always criticize. And look, uh, we, we talked about yesterday what happened at Florida AM. Florida AM should be ashamed of themselves for running off that brother who was an athletic director. Mm -hmm. Here you had, and, and, and here you had a competent brother where they were running a deficit in the athletic department for a decade. They've had a balanced budget for the last three years. They ran them off. Why? Because he was sitting here making changes. They ain't never made that much money in the, in the history of the athletic department. We've got to have competent, strong African-Americans. And let me say this here. One of the reasons why many of our black professionals don't want to fool with black organizations, because they don't want to do a bullshit. And so here you have Van, an attorney, head of the, of the state conference of the NAACP. Uh, a brother just took over the Georgia branch of the NAACP. Uh, I, I see this all around the country. We've got to learn to put egos aside and we've got to create strong black institutions because Mason, they could not do this. And there was the NAACP that stepped in and able to help Mason bringing their firepower, legal power to stand with them. And so for the people who say, well, I don't know why I should I should be supporting them. This is why. And if they do something you disagree with, feel free to say something. Right. 
No, I, I couldn't agree more with what you just stated. And one of the things that I love, you know, I always say this, I, I hear what you say, but I see what you do. And so a lot of people who complain about these longstanding institutions like the NAACP, like the Urban League, and like many of the others, they just complain, but they're not there putting in the work to actually make things better. We complain about, you know, quote unquote, aging leadership or seasoned leadership, but the younger folks, these younger generations of people who have the time, the money and the attention, they, you know, sometimes we just don't spend the time dedicating our volunteer hours or the time that we could volunteer to make our communities better. And so when we go out and vote, that's great that you know everyone is exercising their right to vote, but what are you actively doing beyond the vote? What are you actively doing to make your community better? And being a part of a historic black institution is a is an easy way. It's a it's low-hanging fruit as we say in politics for you to get involved um, you know, makes, you know, real impact in a short amount of time or a long amount of, long amount of time, depending on the project. But I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, HBCUs, black institutions, these are the places where people should be pouring their dollars and their talent into. I can't, you know, you, you, brought, you raised that about people's talent. There are lawyers and doctors and, you know, professional people. And these institutions need those types of resources. And they need it at a pro bono basis. Because if we're going to fight these systemic things and these systemic challenges that are happening across the country, not only in Mason, but just nationally, we need people to go into these institutions and say, I am willing to help, you know, move this agenda forward so that it will better the community that I live in instead of trying to move out into suburbia areas and assimilate with folks who don't care about us and don't look like us. And so I just want to affirm what you stated, that we need to have more people volunteering, stepping up, being a part of these institutions. Oh, uh, and, and that particular point right there, uh, Larry, people have to understand that when you look at most of our black organizations, these are volunteer organizations. There are 2,000 NAACP branches all across the country. These are not paid positions. They are volunteer positions. So when people are criticizing what folks are not doing, what they don't understand is these people are actually volunteering their time. Some of these people are volunteering 20, 30, 40 hours a week. It essentially is the equivalent of a full-time job. And so uh, I, just want, I just want people to understand that when we start saying, well, where are you, where are you, where are you? Larry, people have to actually grab a mirror and say, where are you? So, Roland, in, in our conversation, I'm thinking about one of the principles of Kwanzaa, you know, collective work and responsibility, right? That's what we're talking about. And it's it's important that the point you're making about volunteer hours. I serve as, as chair of a HBCU Foundation board, and it's a lot of work. <laughs> but you do the work because you love the institution. You want to see HBC for me as HBCU alum. You want to see HBCUs thrive. And you talked about the NAACP and many of our other organizations. You're right. It, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of staying up in the evening. It's it's also about putting your hand in the soil and and talking to folks in the community. Because we know, you know, we also have issues in terms of the class issues sometimes in the black community. We need all, especially now, we need all hands on deck about what's happening with black folks. And we obviously talking about Mason. But once again, folks are always criticizing nonprofit organizations, particularly those, like you said, founded by black folks. But there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and not, you know, getting on TV or not the press conferences, et cetera. And the other thing I want to mention, um, Roland, you talked about black, you talked about black media, because I want to bring this full circle from the crisis so what we talk about on your platform, traditionally, black media has played a critical role in, once again, identifying key issues in our black in the community that are happening. And we have to remember that. And so folks who are watching this need to make sure they support this show so we can talk about more issues relating to communities like Mason and, and various other black communities to make sure we get the word out. And once again, again, the idea of collective work and responsibility so we can come together and make sure we fight on these issues. Uh, and again, we are looking. Uh, here's the deal, y'all. And. And I know the national office, they've already seen the appeal out. But give directly to the Tennessee branch. Right. Give That's directly right. to the Tennessee branch. They're the ones who filed the lawsuit. They're the ones who led it. Give to them. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, I'm going to see, uh, I'm looking for their website right now. 
and, and, and again, folks, I want y'all to understand this because this is also part of the part of this thing. You know, just way too many of our folks, you know, we are expecting we're expecting these folks to do all this work and we expect them uh, to do it for free. Uh, and so that's not how it works. OK, so this is what I want you to do. Uh, pull it up, please. I want y'all to go to uh, pull it up. I want y'all to go to T N N A A C P dot O R G T N N A A C P dot O R D. You sit here and you see there are two banners. There's the Tennessee State Conference. There's a national headquarters. I want you to get to the Tennessee State Conference. If you are appreciative of the work that they did in this particular uh, uh, lawsuit uh, to help Mason, Tennessee, I want you to donate to the Tennessee State Conference of the NAACP. That's what I want you to do. And so, again, I, uh, again, the link is TNN, T-N-N-A-A-C-P dot O-R-G, T-N-N-A-A-C-P dot O-R-G. Support that branch. They were the ones who filed the lawsuit against Mason, Tennessee. Support them uh, in what they did. That's how we're able to build uh, a collective and build and grow stronger. All right, folks, back to our whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Patrol Grooming is a men's grooming company that delivers on this promise every day to men everywhere. Everything we do, every product we make is designed to help you to present your best self. It's a promise they've kept since 1991 when they first introduced the Bump Patrol brand, the number one men's product for smooth, bump-free, shaven, silky skin. Millions of customers count on their exceptional skin care products, which can be found at more than 30,000 retail stores in more than 50 countries around the world. Now you can have exceptional, be exceptional beard and skin care products that are as unique as you are. Fellas, as we prepare to head back out into the world of COVID restrictions uh, being lifted, it's time to get our groove back on so you can visit patrolgrooming.com to order a patrol grooming box. Use the discount code hashtag Roland30, R-O-L-A-N-D-3-0 for a 30% discount at checkout. We certainly support patrol grooming being uh, a sponsor of Roland Martin Unfiltered and the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. <laughs> support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. <laughs> All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? 